Hi guys, um, as Johnny said, uh, and Billy, I'm um, going to talk to you about abdominal wall blocks. Um, this was titled Novel Abdominal Wall Blocks, but there's, there's a few of them, but I could, don't think it could span out 45 minutes on just that. So we're going to just recap some of the existing ones. I know there's a vari ver uh, good variation of clinical abilities and expertise with reading land seeds in the room, so hopefully there's something for everyone in here. Um, before we do that, we just have to talk about uh, some anatomy. Um, and we can split that into the anterior and the posterior abdominal wall. So if we think about the anterior abdominal wall, from the outside to the inside, obviously you've got skin and then variable amounts of subcut tissue. Uh, and then we get down to the, the block of muscles and, and, and they're usually associated with their aponeurosis, which are quite important. So obviously we've got um, rectus muscle sits on top and then we've got the oblique muscles and we've got the transverse abdominis at, at the bottom. Um, not in that order it's up there, I'm afraid. You've then got transversalis fascia, um, which is quite an important structure because that dictates a lot of the spread of some of the blocks that we do. And then you've got uh, some fat again, and then you're down to peritoneum. Um, so some of these blocks, we are going fairly close to peritoneum, so it is quite important that you have decent uh, ultrasound skills and you can identify the structures that you're targeting. Um, if we think about the, the posterior abdominal wall, um, there's a couple of important fascias. So there's the, the thoracolumbar fascia, um, which encases some of the, the muscles of the back, and, and that includes the, um, the erector spinae muscle, which is actually three separate muscles in itself, um, and also uh, a muscle which has become quite trendy more recently, the quadratus lumborum muscles, which we'll come on to. Um, and then you've got transversalis fascia, uh, and th this is one of the layers of the, of the thoracolumbar fascia, and it lines the deep aspect of the transverse abdominis muscle, and again, it's quite an important one in terms of spread of local anaesthetic. Interestingly, about this, trans that this fascia is that it's continuous um, cordially with the fascia iliaca, and it's continuous and blends with the endothoracic fascia of the thorax. Now, the endothoracic fascia is that structure that Varma was talking about, which is in the paravertebral space, but you can't really see it, and there's a debate about whether it splits the paravertebral space into anterior and posterior, and, and we don't really know whether there's a difference in terms of where you inject, whether it's anterior or posterior to that endothoracic fascia. Uh, but we'll talk about the relevance of them. So if we look at uh, the, the anatomy, so um, it doesn't project very well on that side, I'm afraid, does it? So you've obviously got the rectus muscle um, on top, which is a, a muscle on either side, and in the midline you've got a, a linear alba. Um, then you've got the three muscles which are on the, on the side of the rectus muscle, uh, especially more, lower, more cordially. So you've got the transverse abdominis, which is the deepest one, then you've got the internal oblique and the external oblique. Um, and it's quite important to understand how those muscles fit together because when you scan, you'll often see two or three or, or even all of these muscles uh, and to be able to identify exactly where you are. If we just go and look a little bit further on about the uh, anatomy, that I know you've seen something very similar to this, but at the top here, you've got the rectus muscles. Uh, and just under there, you've got uh, posterior rectus sheath and then you've got transversalis fascia and then you've got some fat and then the peritoneum. As you come round to the side, uh, the, the, the three muscles, the, uh, the, the, the internal oblique, transverse abdominis, and the external oblique, uh, move laterally into aponeuroses. Um, so the aponeuroses, and then they move into the muscles as they come round here. Some of the nerves run bet between these layers, and we're going to look at that in another slide. Down here is the area of the posterior abdominal wall block, so these are the muscles of interest. Um, as you can see, the transverse abdominis here tapers into an aponeurosis again, and that abuts uh, the lateral aspect of a muscle here called the quadratus lumborum muscle. And that's often just lateral to the transverse process, and that makes it quite an easy muscle to find an ultrasound. Anteriorly to that, you've got a big uh, muscle, which is the psoas muscle. And behind that, you've got this group of muscles here, which is the erector spinae. And then sometimes you get the lat dorsi muscle on the side as well. If we look at that in terms of anatomy, um, this is a, a section obviously down in the probably L3 region, or maybe a bit lower because we can't really see my kidney here, so we're probably quite low here. Um, this is the big psoas muscle, this is the quadratus laborum muscle, and this is the erector spinae group. And that is termed the sort of shamrock appearance, uh, and we'll see that in old stands as well. And again, here we've got the rectus muscle and the three muscles of the lateral, anterolateral abdominal wall there. Other thing that's important to know about is the vessels. Um, and within the, the transverse abdominis plane, so that's between transverse abdominis and internal oblique, uh, 
there are there is a rich network of vessels, and that has an, uh, an impact on how much locally you can put in there and the, and the absorption rates of that local anaesthetic. In the rectus sheath, um, you can have bilateral superior epigastric arteries, and these anastomos with the deep inferior epigastric arteries. So it's very important again when you're doing these blocks to have a, a, a look with the Doppler for the for the vessels. The, the important bit is the innovation, isn't it? So anterior abdominal wall um, you've, is basically supplied from the anterior or ventral rami, rami of the T6 to T12 um, spinal, uh, nerve roots, which are obviously called the intercostal uh, nerves. The T12 nerve is also called the um, subcostal nerve. And then you also have the ileungonal and the iliohypogastric, which come from L1. And uh, they, they obviously traverse the, the muscular layers and they, they uh, part of their course run very close to the anterior superior spine of the, of the, of the pelvis. Um, the intercostal nerves themselves continue, they come from the intercostal uh, space, they enter the abdomen in the tap plane and they give a lateral branch and then the rest of the nerve carries on anteriorly, perforates the rectus and ends in the anterior branches. So this is the picture that we've got again. Um, so you've got, up here you've got your, your spinal cord obviously, and then your dorsal and ventral nerve roots, uh, your dorsal root ganglion, and then here you sp here's your spinal nerve. So here's your, 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 your dorsal root, which is, supplies the skin and anterior structure, uh, posterior structures of the back, and then your spinal nerve continues around here. This is the sympathetic chain coming in, and this is the area of interest of the paravertebral block that we talked about earlier. The uh, anterior ramus comes around here, and you there's a, a lateral branch, and then this is the anterior branch which comes around up here. So again, another picture just to demonstrate that. Uh, this would be the area where you'd be thinking about your paravertebral block. Uh, but you, this is the, the posterior uh, costal nerve, and this is the anterior one which travels. And you can see here, it's traveling between the transverse abdominal muscle and the internal oblique muscle. And in the lateral aspect, it's perforating those muscles to give a lateral nerve branch, which actually supplies the cutaneous of quite a long area of skin here. The, the continuation of that intercostal nerve comes through here and it pierces the rectus muscles to give the anterior cutaneous nerve in the abdomen. Again, just some pictures. So this is how they all come down. This is 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. This is subcostal nerve 12. And notice that the anterior branch of subcostal nerve actually comes fairly way down and it can sometimes get down onto the, the, the top of the thigh. Um, and these are the anterior branches perforating the, the muscles and the rectus muscles and supplying the cutaneous abdomen at the front. Just another view of the same thing. Uh, and you can see here the iliwinginal, the iliohypogastric nerve from L1 root, how they run very closely to the, uh, to the, to the iliac crest. The three uh, original blocks that most people will have heard of, or maybe two that most people will have heard of, was obviously the rectus sheath block. And this is the sort of distribution of, of sensory anesthesia you might get. Uh, obviously it's midline only because all you're doing is blocking those anterior cutaneous branches. Then there was a, a modification of the, of, then there was obviously the tap block which is, uh, gets you this sort of lower umbilical, umbilicus downwards, this sort of area. Obviously uh, you, you're not going to get as far around the, the side but you'll get a fair bound of the front and, and the anterolateral area. And there's a modification of the tap block called the subcostal tap block. Uh, which, as uh, you know, is claimed, gives you a sensory area of distribution of this sort of area, because you're not going to get up here with a, with a standard um, low tap block. So rectus sheath blocks, um, again, the ant anterior cutaneous branches, it's midline anesthesia. Uh, and basically what you're doing is you're putting a local uh, between the rectus muscle and the posterior rectus sheath. And you've got to do this above the umbilicus because the posterior rectus sheath is defunct below the arcuate line, which is around the level of the umbilicus. So it doesn't exist back there. You've, you've, you've just got transvillous fascia, fat and peritoneum. You haven't got the posterior rectus sheath below the umbilicus. Obviously, we've talked about the arteries that are, that are there in the rectus sheath, which you have to be very careful of. Uh, and for midline laparotomy, you'll need bilateral injections. Uh, what this block is really handy for is catheters because it's a, a very nice plane, you can open it up and you can very easily thread in a straight catheter into that, into that plane. So this is what it kind of looks like. Um, this is obviously the rectus muscles and then you've got your, uh, your little vessel in here, or a catheter in that case, and this, this is a catheter on this diagram. Uh, and this is the fascia transversalis which we mentioned separates uh, 
the fat and the peritoneum from the rectus muscles. And this is your, uh, your rect rectus sheath uh, surrounding the rectus muscle. And the midline is the linear alba. So an ultrasound, if you scan it, um, I think this is a transverse scan. You can see here you've got bowel. There's peritoneum and bowel under here. And here is your posterior rectus sheath. And it looks like a tramline appearance, which, and that's what you're kind of looking for. This is a rectus muscle. This is anterior rectus sheath. And this is skin and fat, fat and skin up there. So the idea is uh, you get your anesthetic just between the muscular tissue and that bright line there. And you'll, when you do it correctly, you'll see a very nice, clear pooling of black local anesthetic between those two. The tap block um, is quite interesting. It's had multiple um, reinventions over the years, uh, starting back from the sort of uh, triangle of petite approach um, and then becoming ultrasound guided techniques. And then now we're seeing a, a sway back to the original sort of idea with the QL blocks and things. But um, essentially, the a standard tap block, you only really get lower um, abdominal uh, sensory loss. So T10 to 12 lateral branches, and you might get ileoinguinal ileal hypogastric. Interestingly, there are some uh, blocks that rely on spread um, within the to up to the thoracic pyrovertebral space, which are related to the tap block. And tap block can even give you spread up to the thoracic pyrovertebral spaces. Um, and you may even get up to T10, but this is not, I wouldn't say this was widely seen in practice, uh, and you probably need quite a lot of volume to get that high. Uh, but that's because of the spread between the transmissilis fascia and the anterior surface of the quadratus lumborum muscle. So this is the tap block technique. Um, rectus muscles up there, anterior cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve, or the anterior root. Uh, this is the lateral branch, and this is the transverse abdominus muscle. This is the internal oblique muscle. Uh, what you're looking here is you put your probe on fairly laterally, uh, even a bit of posterior, posterior laterally if you can. And you'll get sort of, oh, this is, jo this is Jonathan's slide, so sorry. About <laughs> there we go. That's where you're trying to get your needle and put your local anesthetic. Uh, and this is the sort of view you would get, uh, standing at the top, subcut tissue, external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis. In this person, all the muscles are nice, chunky muscles, so they're easy to see. Peritoneal cavity, and then you've got bowel down here. Um, and the idea is that you'll come in uh, and get your local anaesthetic uh, just bit in this plane here. Just like that. This was um, some work done uh, to look at the spread of anaesthesia from a tap block. And I think these were all, um, I'll just check, I think these were all standard tap blocks that were done. Um, the cutaneous block was measured 90 minutes after a unilateral ultrasound guided um, posterior tap block in 20 study volunteers. And this is the pattern of anesthesia they've got. So as you can see, it, it does vary quite a lot. Um, now this person's obviously gone down onto L1 here. Um, but if you look at the top, the, the, the cranial extension, it's never really that high, is it? It never really goes much higher than the umbilicus. So you're sort of limited to that. And th that's what makes it good, for example, for um, cesarean section uh, incisions. The subcostal tap. Um, was designed to try and get around this problem of cranial extension of the block. And it, it's, mentioned, it's said to get up to T6 to T9. Um, and the, the problem is these enter the tap medial to the anterior axillary line. So at the level of the costal margin is where you're going to put your ultrasound probe to do this. And the, tap, the TAM muscle, the transverse abdominus muscle, is actually deep to the rectus in this position. So it does look slightly different uh, to the other blocks that we do for the tap, the other approaches to the tap block. Um, here is a picture of someone doing some tap blocks. So this is the uh, traditional lateral tap block uh, between the costal margin and the iliac crest. Uh, and we get that same picture that we talked about last time. This is the subcostal modification. Uh, and here you can see you've got your rectus muscle and you've got uh, your perineal cavity and your transverse abdominus muscle sitting uh, just below it. And the injection is between those two muscles on this side. Um, Obviously, you can get inguinal and ileal hypogastric nerves, uh, good for groin incisions. You can't really do an awake hernia just under this because obviously there's a contribution to spastic cord, etc., from the gentofemoral nerve, and that would have to be blocked in a separate injection, which can be done. Um, so if you're doing this for an awake hernia, the surgeon will still need to infiltrate local anaesthetic uh, once they get further inside. And to do this block, uh, 
you essentially have to m put the probe on an imaginary line um, from the anterior superiliac spine to the umbilicus. And uh, again, just to be aware of vessels in this area as well, the deep circumflex iliac artery. So here we've got someone putting a probe um, for on the, from the, let's orientate ourselves here. So we've got Peyton here, um, this is the anterior superiliac spine, this bony drop out here. And then you've got the muscles. Um, this is pointing up towards the umbilicus and there's a, a line between the assis and the umbilicus. And you've got your transverse abdominus muscle, internal oblique, external oblique. It depends where you are putting the probe. In some patients or some people, if you're too lateral or too low, the transverse abdominus muscle is just a bit of aponeurosis and you won't necessarily see a nice muscle like this. Um, and the other thing to say is that the nerves in this image, you can just about convince yourself are, are sat there between the transverse abdominus and the internal oblique. Occasionally, sometimes it can be between here because obviously they're coming out, so they do are often found as well in this layer here. Uh, but you can see them quite clearly here. Um, so you just need to put some local, it doesn't have to be right on the nerves, you can just get into the plane and you will get a, a successful block of those nerves. Uh, so if we just look at some of the more novel blocks. Um, this was a muscle which I hadn't really heard of until a couple of years ago. No one really talked about it very much. Uh, anyone know what it is? It's the... Yeah, it's a QR muscle. So we've got rectus muscle here. Um, this is your, your iliacus muscle which comes out and this is what you're familiar with, your fascia iliaca blocks, that's what you're looking for. Closely related to that, a bit more medial is, a, is the psoas muscle. And behind them you've got the, uh, the quadratural bore muscle. And you can almost imagine there's a plane between these two muscles, if you're looking from the side. So sort of in here, there's a plane. Uh, and that's uh, one of the targets of uh, these novel blocks. So the quadratural lumbar muscle, um, we're looking now around, the, and this is anterior, this is posterior, so this is sort of a, a probe on the side schematic. Your transverse abdominal muscle, your three muscles here coming around, and they, they taper into these aponeuroses. And the one, the transverse abdominus aponeurosis comes to a point with the quartitis lumborum muscle. And your transverse abdominus muscle is superficial to the transverse alis fascia, which is under these muscles here. So your, trans, your transverse alis fascia is in this area as well. It goes up here and back down there. And somebody said he put some local anaesthetic in this spot here, between the epineurosis of transverse abdominis and the lateral aspect of quadratus lumborum, you'll get a pretty good block and you'll get a, 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 a higher uh, dermatomal spread than you would from a, 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 than a, than an ultrasound guided lateral tap block. Um, what we think is that actually this is probably not too dissimilar from what the original uh, triangular petite block was, was doing. But more uh, recent anatomical studies have shown that the actual ang the triangle of petite is absent in most people, um, and actually it's probably not where they thought it was, and it's probably not that useful anymore clinically or academically. So we don't really pay much attention to that in terms of the blocks that we do nowadays. On ultrasound, if you put the probe on the side, this is the sort of image you're going to get. So you get a vertebral body, you get a transverse process, and then you use it to orientate yourself. Posterior to the transverse process, you'll have a psoas muscle. Anterior, sorry, the, uh, this is the, the um, posterior body. This is quadratus borum. This is the transverse process here. This is the psoas muscle here. And you've got your spinal muscles here, so paraspinal muscles here. And this is what you're looking at on this diagram as well. So your, your muscles are coming round from there. 